Let's see. I, I thought we'd just do a quick intro to Qt. But first, how, how many has worked with Qt or, or knows it? A lot of hands. Good. <laughs> that means that there is actually a chance to do this on time. In, in Gothenburg, this took two and a half hours, and I had a 45-minute slot. So I'm going to try to be brief. <laughs> uh, very quickly about myself. Um, I run a couple of groups in Gothenburg, FOSGBG, inspired by FOS Stockholm, which happens to, to have a meetup tomorrow, highly recommended, and we run a joint event called FOS North annually in April, so you just missed it. Um, I worked with Trolltech, uh, now I work with Pelagic Core, I was Q champion for the documentation I've done in 2016. Um, I wrote a book way back, when before having kids. Uh, and then now I have a web page which was supposed to be a book that I've written together with a friend uh, about QML, uh, which is the very last topic of this talk. But I'll share these links afterwards, so feel free to explore. Uh, as everyone else in this room <laughs> has said, <laughs> I work for a company called Luxoft. We, we just moved offices, so we have 40 empty desks in Gothenburg, if you like, the West Coast. <laughs> uh, we're looking for people. Everyone's looking for people. We're, we're doing embedded Linux system, Qt, C++, uh, primarily for automotive applications. So cars, agricultural, lorries, those types of things. Enough about that. So what is Qt? Um, it's, uh, it's easy to, to forget these days that it's what it is at the core is a cross-platform toolkit. Uh, it's had some detours through Nokia being a device-specific toolkit and so on. But it's a, a cross-platform toolkit targeting basically all desktop environments, and I'm supposed to point with a pointer for the screen share. Um, but also all, uh, or the major uh, mobile platforms. It was the foundations of, uh, of BlackBerry's offering also for instance, so there are more platforms, but these are the ma major ones. Uh, in my day-to-day -day life, it, this is the most important, that you also have direct frame buffer access, so you can build devices that, that aren't a desktop or a mobile system by themselves, and still utilize full hardware acceleration and all of that. Um, the old slogan was, code once, run everywhere, so, so you actually get native applications, uh, even though they're cross-platform. Um, and looking back through the time, Qt was developed back in the early 90s when Java sort of came and this was the promise. We, we can do cross-platform applications, but they all look like Java applications. Here you actually get the full thing. You actually get a binary executable for your platform looking as if it's written for the platform. You find it everywhere, I'd say. Uh, if you go to one of the Qt conferences, they, they make a point of having uh, Qt-based coffee machines, which is kind of funny. Uh, that's probably the low end of the scale. And then everywhere from, I think, Teldus, for instance, is a Swedish example. The mobile phone app is Qt-based. Um, I'm sure the next speaker has more examples coming from KDAB. Uh, cars, of course. So, a bit version history, just to put it into perspective. That was a really pale shade of grey here. I hope the rest of the slides will survive. Um, Qt uses semantic versioning, I think is the term. So, so every time you change the major number, you have an API breakage, sort of. Um, I, I, I would say that this code mostly would actually recompile today, as long as you haven't done anything funny. Uh, you might have to do little tweaks, but the core idea is still the same today. Uh, but it has been stable since 2012, the, the latest version. So, so you can basically just redeploy the, the new shared object files towards your binaries, and it should just work. Uh, and then you have a history all the way back to the 90s, where, where they had their first customer back in 95, uh, which the fault lore has was ESA, the European Space Agency, because Qt could rotate texts on both Windows and X11. <laughs> Then you have a number of names. I, I always find this kind of fun. Uh, the company was incorporated as Quasar Technologies. I would guess that's why it's called Qt, uh, which then became Trolltech, which then got purchased by Nokia, so they called it Qt Software, then Qt Development Frameworks, then Digia bought it out of Nokia. Um, but Digia is a consultancy company, and it was kind of awkward to own a product that your competition used. So they spun it out into the Qt company, which is dedicated to the product. And Didier, of course, has Qt services, but that's a sort of a separate entity. Uh, I work there. Uh, 
this is my favorite logo. And that's the history. Um, here we have this awkward gray thing. It looks awesome on my screen. Um, QT has always, or almost always, been dual licensed. So, I mean, it's a, it's a foundation of KDE, uh, and it has a lot of open source followers. Um, and this basically started around 2.0, where you had the QPL, which was not a GPL compatible open source license. So that was very quickly fixed by having GPL v2. Um, so there was a short window here that caused quite a lot of controversy in the early 2000s. Um, GPL v2 came for x11, then OS X came, which you can run an x11 service server on, uh, or an X server. So basically you had to open up GPL v2 for, for the Mac OS platform. And then when 4.0 came, they actually went for GPL2 or for all the platforms. And that only sort of grew the business. So they learned to trust this, uh, this dual licensing model. Um, then they added GPL v3. Nokia didn't want to sell software. They wanted to sell devices. So they actually added LGPL. Uh, are you familiar with the difference between GPL and LGPL? I see some nodding heads. So, so very quickly, here you have to re-contribute the fixes you do to QT, but you can still keep your stuff, your application to yourself. While here you have to sort of re-share re everything on the same terms. Um, and right now it's moving towards LGPL v3. Um, and there's all these licenses exist, but newer modules only have the, the v3 versions of the, of the licenses. It's sort of a gradual thing. Uh, in parallel to all of this, you have the KD Free QT Foundation that basically says that if the owner of the commercial rights of QT would cease the development, uh, this becomes BSD, which means that everyone can do whatever they like with it, basically. Just, I think you need to share the name of the copyright holder, so to speak, that this is QT owned by yada yada. But uh, for instance, Mac OS is based on, on a BSD kernel, uh, or BSD licensed kernel. And then, of course, you have the commercial offering down here where you can agree on your commercial terms with uh, the current owners of the Qt company in this case. Uh, so you can distribute it any way you want to. Qt is a proper open source project. I mean, it, it hasn't always been. I mean, this it has still been a product developed by a single company for a long part of, of this thread. It's just that it's had more licensing options for, for the users. Um, but since the foundation of the Qt project, um, this is a pure meritocratic project. So, so anyone can contribute and anyone can become an approver or reviewer or, or whatever role you want to take. And it's, you, you get the role depending on, on how much effort you spend and how much time you, you give to the project. Um, and it's quite diverse. Uh, so the dark blue one here is the, the Qt company, who obviously does the most since they sell the product. Uh, this happens to be KDAP. Um, and then you have a number of contributors here, so you have Intels. The red one is actually individuals, so I would assume that's more or less open source contributions. Um, and these are the top ten of, of sort of the essential modules. Um, and it's a really great community, so, so it's fun to join it. And even Torvalds, who hates C++, <laughs> preferred this. <laughs> I, I watched the subsurface talks on uh, Postum, uh, and they're kind of fun, because he does not like the technology, but he likes the community, so they actually choose to go with Qt anyway. Then what, what is Qt? I mean, to, to a lot of people, Qt is a graphical framework. You, you do graphics, and most applications using Qt historically is graphical. But that's not the end of it, so to speak. So you have the central modules. Those are available for, for all platforms, everywhere. And I mean, you have core, you have GUI, you have multimedia, and so on. And these, these sort of drive in the graphical direction. I'm pointing on the wrong screen again. Um, but you also have network, for instance. And you have SQL. Uh, and you have the testing frameworks. And then if you go towards add-ons, which are available for selected platforms, you have Edge in I.O., which is more or less of an IoT or a cloud backend. You, you have Bluetooth, and so on. You have concurrency support. And you have the next slide. Um, then you have, outside of these, you have the KDE frameworks. Um, one of the big changes going between KDE 4 and KDE 5 is that you, you separated out functionality 
from KDE to make it reusable. So, so they separate their modules in tiers, where the tier ones are only dependent on themselves, so to speak. Or if they incorporate libarchive, of course they have external dependencies, but they don't depend on the rest of KDE, while tier two sort of depends on tier one and themselves, and so on, while these tier four modules are fairly, fairly integrated into KDE. And, and here you have, I mean, you have a lot of modules sitting in here, incorporating even more functions, many non-visual. Um, and then finally I have the include.org site that lists Qt modules in general, and in a month ago, before I did it in Gothenburg, there were 207 modules online. Um, so there, there's quite a lot of, to choose from, more than this GUI module. It's, it's a lot bigger. Then you have Qt Creator, which the next speaker is going to talk to talk about, so I, I will actually not say anything more about it. It's a very nice ID, it made me abandon BIM, so <laughs> it has the power. <laughs> so now I want to talk about Q from a technical C++ hardcore <laughs> detailed perspective. Um, I have some highlights um, that I want to share. There, there is of course a lot, and I've, I've made these into sort of a priority order of what's the most important to know of, to, to understand what it's about. So when you grow tired of me, tell me to go off stage and we will skip the rest. <laughs> so everything starts with a Q object class. O almost everything inherits Q object, and this is the class that sort of brings the superpowers uh, to, uh, to the rest of QT. Um, so you could always say that the rest of this talk is about what Q object adds to QT. Um, because that's the specifics. And, and a good background is also, I mean, this came in 95. The uh, Java was hot, hot, where you have the base object class, uh, you have introspection, you, you have cross-platform capabilities. The competition was MFC, if you've ever used it, it's painful. Uh, so, so in that light, this was quite revolutionary when it came, and, and the basic patterns still hold. So one of the complaints about C++ is always that it's hard to manage memory. Uh, but here it's not, because every Q object has a parent. And the parent is responsible for destructing its children, which might sound very brutal. But it, it, it actually helps. So, so all you need to do is to keep track of your little root object. And, and the rest can sort of be handled by, by Q object. And when you do a visual layout, uh, as this one, the, the parent-child relationship is actually represented by the, the way that the screen looks. So, so these, the add button, the text edit, and so on, these are actually children that has this, the main widget, the window, as its parent. So, so you sort of get it for free by just laying out your stuff. Um, and that means that you can just allocate the root object on the stack, so you know that when you exit your main function, it gets destructed and it just takes care of the rest. So it actually takes out a lot of the keeping track of, of all your children, all your elements um, from your code. Um, this is cut and paste from a little code example that I have here. Uh, and I hope that this is going to, to survive the screen sharing. Um, so I didn't even do a to-do list, but it's a magical application where, where you can do lists and you can clear the lists. Um, and well, what you can see here, which we're going to dive into to later, is that these two items here, the buttons, I don't need outside of the constructor. So, so these are, are local variables to something allocated onto the heap. Uh, to actually implement the add button, I need access to the list itself and to the line edit. So these two I, I keep as, as private members. But we will see that code later on. Uh, another really nice thing is that you have the delete later function. Uh, when you do complex deconstructions and want to sort of tell objects that you're about to pull them down, that's actually a, a real lifesaver. You, you can tag objects to say that you will be destructed when this call tree returns to, to the main loop, and then everything gets destructed. So you can sort of sheet and delete an object while still using it for a while. Uh, it can get you out of circular dependencies and so on. So it's, it's actually really handy. The other half would be signals and slots, and this, I would argue, is the more 
sort of famous part of, of Qt. Um, it looks like custom sections in your header files, um, which makes some people believe that this is not C++, but it is. You have a preprocessor. These are removed at compile time. Um, but here we say that we have a private slot called do add. If we wanted to do signals that we can emit, uh, we would have a section calling sig called signals in the same way. And you can do private slots, protected slots, and public slots. Uh, and what these are are basically callbacks. So a slot can be connected to a signal. As soon as the signal is called, all the slots are invoked. Uh, so the signal is basically just a for loop iterating over pun function pointers. So it's, there is no black magic. It's just that you have tooling that makes it safe. You, you don't screw up. Um, and the way that this then looks in the code is um, that you do these connections. So, so we're back to, to the old example. Let's see where the function point or the mouse pointer is. So we have a number of connects after having instantiated the things. I said that we don't need the buttons anymore outside of the constructor. We don't need to keep track of the pointers to those. Because what we do here is that we say the clear button has a signal called clicked, something happened. And then we want the lists slot clear to be invoked. Uh, this is the, the modern way to write it. Uh, C++ 11 compatible and so on with, with function pointers, so this actually fails at compilation. But you are bound to run into to this construct, which actually is string-based. Uh, so this fails at, at, at runtime, but it does the same thing. So you have an add button with a signal called clicked. That calls the do add method of this widget. And then you have another one here. When the line edit has returned pressed, it also does the do add. And I mean, the, this general glue code isn't that magical. But what's actually very interesting is that the, uh, this part here is a part of the Qt li library. This is a part of the Qt library that was never sort of hard coded to be tied together with that slot. Uh, this part of the Qt library doesn't even know that this part of our little trivial example exists when it's compiled. So, so you get these Lego bricks that, that you can connect through the signal and so, slot mechanisms and you, and you can carry parameters. You can em emit a signal with an integer to it and you don't know what you're about to do with the integer on the other hand. So comparing to, to for instance MFC you don't have to subclass everything. You just use the class instances that you find in the Qt library. Uh, and it means that it's really easy to combine your, your various Q-object-derived classes into sort of the bigger Lego buildings. Um, so here's basically the do-add method, um, which is ordinary imperative C++. We, we add the current text to the list, we clear it, and we set the focus to it so that even if you click the add button, you can just keep on typing the next thing you do. Um, I'm not sure if it's very interesting, but the uh, the entire code doesn't fit on the screen. Um, looks something like this. That's the full setup. So, so we instantiate everything, then we do some layout thingies here just to get the things to, to position correctly. We connect the things together, and, and here then we can drop the buttons. We don't touch them anymore. We, we trust the parent to take care of them. And then in the do add, we use the list and the line edit that we happen to keep for that specific purpose. So how does this work, since I say it's, <laughs> it's not black magic? Uh, it, it is actually vanilla C++, but you have a tool called the mock, the meta object compiler. And, and what it does is that it takes your header file and it compiles a second C++ file out of it. Those are the implementation of your signals and a table to look up the slots. Uh, and this C++ file just joins the general flow, produces an object file that ends up into a binary. And yes, it's yet another tool. It's something that parses your header file. It's something that's sensitive to, to, to various breakage. It can shoot you in the foot, and it's rather painful the first time because you don't have a clue what broke. But it's also very, very convenient. And it, it's not that different to, to, for instance, what we do with, with resources. And here we have the late light gray boxes again. Um, 
So basically taking a resource file, pointing it at, for instance, images or other binary assets that you want to be a part of your binary, compiled into a C++ or C file that just contains the raw data and then just joins the build flow to become a part of the binary. It's just that we, we generate the intermediary file here from a header file and not from a resource file. And of course you have QMake and CMake and Cubes and all of these tools that help you do the make file for these. You don't have to care about mm -hmm. creating additional targets and things like that. It just works. So how does all of this start spinning? Uh, you, you need an event loop. Uh, that's one of the main things with, with graphical programs and is one of the strengths of Qt that you have an event loop as the base. So, so the actual main function here demonstrates the the life cycle of, of objects. So we allocate the top level widget, the window, on, on the stack. So, so we don't have to care about it. It will be destructed when we leave the function scope. Um, we tell it to become visible and then we call the exec function of the application object. And then the event loop spins. So so every time every time something happens here it sort of emits the, the correct signals, slots and so on. Uh, and, and you don't have to do this little while loop and poll events and, and wait for events and, and all of that. It's, it's taken care of. So there are events, of course. Uh, the, the platform abstractions themselves uh, convert platform-specific events into these generic events, like a key event, a mouse event, a close event, or whatever event. Uh, and, and these are all based on the QEvent class, um, if you want to start digging in the documentation. Um, most of these events end up in uh, virtual methods, so you can take care of them easily. There, there is a master sort of virtual method where you can do the big switch case and see which event was this, and, and then you do your handling. Uh, but for instance, mouse presses and so on are present in the QWidget based class, and you can subclass it and implement it. You can do your paint event, you can do all of those things. And it does require some classing, so you're actually creating a new widget when, when you're implementing this one. Uh, so it's a bit more static or fixed or, or harder to change than, than signals and slots that you, you can use to connect at runtime in different combinations to create something new. Uh, but the big benefit is that a, a signal is a fire and forget, forget thing. You, you emit a signal and you don't care what happens in the other end. But with an event, you, you can say that I accept this event, I ignore this event, or, or I want to cancel this event, or, or whatnot. So, so for instance, a top-level widget would let the event pass down to its children until there is a child that doesn't have more children, if you click it, and that one will accept the event. Uh, so there the actual event is then processed. Um, one example that you commonly run into is the close event, where you have this yes, no, save, cancel, uh, dialogue. That's an event that you want to cancel sometimes. Um, and then you can't use a signal on a slot for it. So slightly differently. But in, in most cases this is taken care of. You don't care about mouse down, mouse up, mouse move for a button. You want to know it's clicked. And then you're done. And then you have a signal. You're awfully quiet. <laughs> um, then you have something that, that comes with history. Um, Qt has, been, has had Unicode-based strings since 95 or prior, when they started. Um, it also has translation tools and so on built in. So, so using the QString class, you get that for free. You don't have to care about that. Uh, and you have these various conversions functions so from local 8-bit or from UTF-8 or from Latin or, or whatnot, uh, and also two. Uh, it also has a nice API for, for sort of algorithms, so slicing, filtering, joining, splitting, all, all of these things that you want to do with strings. Um, and I mean, the purpose has been to actually have Unicode across all platforms and have a common behavior to strings across all platforms. Um, when it comes to cross-platform behavior, you have the same for, for containers, which becomes less and less relevant these days since C++ is actually catching up and becoming sort of stable across all platforms. Uh, if I have a bad day, I would, uh, I would blame Visual Studio 6 for a lot 
of the, the strangeness in here and their template handling. Uh, that actually led to the creation of many of these classes. And I mean, from a Qt project perspective, they spent a huge amount of effort making sure that these are actually optimized as data structures across compilers and platforms. So it's not just creating a new name for the sake of it, but they, they actually do quite a lot of smart tricks to, to make sure that the queue list, for instance, is an optimal linked list implementation. Um, they have nice little tricks so that if the data type is the size of a pointer or smaller than the pointer, you don't allocate a node object, you actually put it in that piece of storage and so on. Um, so they are quite efficient, uh, and you still get these from the APIs. So if, uh, if you split a string from QString, you get the QString list. You don't get a standard string list with, with wide characters, for instance. Um, but if you want to cross the bridge in between uh, Qt containers and non-Qt containers, you have functions to sort of do deep copies from standard containers to Qt and the other way around. But then you could do deep copies. So you don't just share sort of the reference to, to the element Looking back at the, the history of this, you, you don't only have the, the C++ style iterators, you can do Java style iterators. I, I, I come from a C++ background, I haven't coded much Java at all, so, so I never use it. But you do have the ability to iterate that way. Uh, another one, uh, QVariant. Uh, this is coming in, in recent C++ standards but this has been around since forever um, in Qt. Um, it's more or less a smart union. It's a union that knows what its content is. Uh, it could also be empty, so you can actually check if it's sort of null. Uh, so very easy to use for, for the standard types. You can just put an integer in there, you can put a string there, you can put a double in there, and so on. But then you, you have some magic, so, so in your header file, you can just tag your file with this qdeclare method type macro, so, so you generate some code for it, which then means that you can use your type, uh, which happens to be capital T here, together with the variant. You, you don't have to do more than this qdeclare method type uh, with the type in here. Uh, then you get these functions to, to convert it to a variant and pull it back out of a variant. You can check if that's the contents of the variant and so on. So as you get what you need to be able to pass things around. Uh, this has a bit to do with the needs of signals and slots because you can send values with signals and if you do that across threads, I don't have a slide for that, you actually need to be able to serialize and deserialize data types because you pass it in between event loops and then you need a type system to, that supports that. Um, to actually be able to do that with signals and slot, you don't only need to have sort of the the code for for this part, but you need to be able to create the T object out of thin air um, and the other way around. And then you actually need to at runtime run this Q register meta type templated function. Why do you have to serialize and deserialize when you send it across threads? Because then you want to pass it through the main loop. So so let's let's do Qt and threads, just for fun's sake. So, so you have a, when you enter the main function here, I mean, here you start the event loop of the main thread. But you can create an object called QThread, which basically is another thread. And you can call exec on it to make it start spinning its event loop. And then you can move Q objects to that thread or instantiate them within that thread if you want to. Uh, which gives that Q object a thread affinity, they call it. They know which thread they belong to. And when you do singles and slots in a single thread, it's just a callback. So it's, it's a for loop actually literally calling the function pointers that you give to it. But when you do it with objects that have different thread affinities, it will serialize that call into which call it's supposed to be and what data types it carries, and then post it to the other event loop. So you don't have to m sort of mind uh, the uh, dual entry points, so to speak, or, or entering the same code twice and, and doing mutexes and stuff for that reason. It will be a new event the next time you reach the event loop. So you sort of always do your full call stack, and then you get the event from the other thread, which happens to be a signal. It gives you a slightly different behavior, 
because that means that the signal isn't necessarily blocking from the calling thread. So you don't know that it's been processed on the other side. So you can still do deadlocks and all the funky shit that you can end up with. I mean, it's not bulletproof in any way. And you do have mutexes and semaphore types and all of that for Qthread. Uh, but in, in most cases, if you want to pass on a button click or something and have a working thread that just does the processing, it's enough in, in most cases. And then, then you want to just pass the event along. Uh, and I didn't show that in the example, but for instance, you have if you have a slider, you get a value changed event that carries an integer. Uh, and then for, for instance, a spin box or something, you have a set value function that takes an integer. So you can pass a data type along with your signal slot pair. And then you need this. I mean, I showed some C++11 stuff, but Qt is moving in this direction. Uh, one of the things that's blocking the moving is that to change the major number, or to keep the major run number, rather, to, to stay in the 5 dot something series, you're not allowed to change the, uh, the ABI. You can extend it, but not change it. And it has silly limitations. You can't reorder things in header files, for instance, because you need the ABI, the binary interface, to be identical. So you can take a new shared object file and just drop it into the same context. And that means that a lot of the fun stuff with C++11 cannot be applied because the refactoring involved is too large. So they need to hit the 6.0 to be able to do that. And it's being discussed, I think, before 2020, but nobody sort of wants to commit to when it happens. Um, the change from Qt4 to Qt5, for instance, was more about the modularity of the code base rather than the APIs. So usually these changes are, well, not trivial, but they're fairly small on the, on the code side. But it's still a point where you allow yourself to break the APIs. Uh, and then you want to do all the changes. So it's, the, it's a balance act, basically. Um, but what you, what you do have is since 5.7, uh, so a couple of years back, you, you have to have C++11 support uh, in your compiler to actually build Qt. Um, they have a lot of macros that sort of help the transition for, for even older versions, uh, where, where you basically can add the C++11 keywords as a macro that shows up if you have a C++11 compiler which is helpful because then you get error messages, but you can still build the code for an older compiler if you have Qt prior to 5.7. Um, but what you, the, the biggest thing is really what I showed, that, uh, that you don't get connection errors at runtime. That's something that's really painful during testing because you need to make sure that you go through all the instantiations that do connect calls, otherwise to, to catch those errors. Uh, now you can convert it to, uh, to compile time errors, which is really great. And actually, a consequence of that is that you can put a lambda over here, which also is really nice. One thing that you need to keep in mind is that you do, let me see here, you do the connect call here in the constructor, but this is not when the actual event takes place. So if you capture something from the local function scope here, uh, you can still sort of mess up you need to be careful about what you capture into this lambda as it's something that's bound to an event that will take place one or multiple times later on. But again, you save a shitload of glue code if you just have a little function that calls another function with a slightly different type profile, for instance. Um, a nice thing if you, if you really want to optimize your memory usage is the QString literal function. Since uh, C++11 supports expressing UTF-16 strings, and that has been the internal format for Qt since way, way, way back. Um, so you can reduce that copy uh, of data from sort of your, uh, your static parts of the binary into, into the dynamic parts. Um, but throughout all of this, you have a lot of overlaps, and that's what's interesting about Qt, uh, Qt version 6. Well, what's going to happen there? You have the container types, you have regular expressions, you have threading, you have strings that now are Unicode compatible in, in later C++ versions. 
There, there are a lot of things where you need to make up your mind and where the Qt project needs to think about how much backwards compatibility you would want in the code bases versus how much do you want to reduce the maintenance of the Qt code base by simply relying on what, what the standard library brings. And again, how much can you rely on the various compilers and, and vendors of SDL libraries to actually be compatible? Uh, because you don't want your customers to do if depths across code bases just to handle platforms. The, the task of Qt is to, to make sure they have a single code base as far as possible in between the platforms. Then I'm getting to QML, uh, which is an interesting topic. And I'm just going to ask, who, who is familiar with QML and has, has worked or heard with it? Fewer hands. <laughs> so, given all that we had before, uh, the Q objects and, and the type system, you, you also have introspectability through the Q object classes. So, for instance, you can ask it if it inherits something else and, and so on, and do these things at runtime. So, a lot of what you can do with Java, because Java has a virtual machine, but now you can do it in sort of a, a natively compiled format. QML utilizes that. Um, other things does that as well. You, you have Qt script, which allows you to script <coughs> Q objects using JavaScript. Since quite a long while back, you have Python binding, bindings, which rely on the introspectability of Q objects. But here you have a declarative language built on sort of Q objects themselves, so it maps very, very well. Um, and it can be used for anything, QML. But it, the primary cause, and it, this sounds like I'm repeating myself, it's primarily used for graphical user interfaces, but you can use it for whatever that use, happens to use a Q object. Uh, so there is actually a separation between QML as a language and the Qt Quick module, which is the, uh, the OpenGL, or I shouldn't say OpenGL anymore, the, uh, the accelerated graphics stacks uh, that map onto C++ objects. So it's a way to, to express a scene graph, so, so, so a tree of what happened to be OpenGL elements, but which now can be Vulkan or even software rendered. Uh, it also handles states and transitions uh, and animation lines and time factors, so to speak, in, in between these things. Uh, and you can do style controls for various platforms, so you can actually do what we did in widgets with QML if you, if you want to. Uh, the driving factor be behind QML was Nokia, uh, because Qt was a desktop cross-platform toolkit when they acquired it. And you don't want to build a device UI that looks like Windows 95, with sort of square elements that clip their children. You can't do transitions outside of your boundary, so to speak. They, they wanted to break that limitation. And they, they actually had animation frameworks and so on prior to QML, but this is really where the, the floodgates opened. So how does it look? Um, I, I stole a picture from Luxoft Pelagicor, you know, just for the sake of it. This, this is how it looks in, in our example. So, so for instance, these circular dials do not cut the sides of, of this underlying thing. They're, they're semi-transparent. Uh, this one is, is transparent and shows the live map through it and so on. Uh, you can do, do even more things. So, so I have a very, very basic example. Um, and I just want to explain how this maps onto Q objects and the C++ half of things, because it's, it's a new language, yes, but it's just a way to express something that takes a long time to write in C++, but it still instantiates the same Q objects and so on in the background. So every word, I suppose point here, um, every word that starts with a capital character is an instantiation. So this is a new of something. Uh, and the parent-child relationship, uh, sort of the rectangle contains the mouse area, is given by sort of the scopes, uh, the curly braces. Um, then you have property and what you bind the property to. An ID, the very first thing, happens to be magical. That's the name of the object. You don't have to give a name of an object, but if you want to be able to reference to it, you, you use the ID property. Uh, Everything else is basically a property with a type and then JavaScript. Uh, this won't be JavaScript because it's constant. It's, it's the string red and it has a type and so on. Uh, but for instance, down here, we're more sort of approaching the, the dynamic space where you actually add 
JavaScript scripting into, into the right-hand side of these expressions. Uh, the interesting part is that you actually bind uh, this property to, to the right side. So it's not as if you assign it. Uh, it's more like Excel or a functional language. When you change the right-hand side, the left-hand side is re-evaluated, which is really interesting when you do sort of bigger graphical systems, when you want things to move in, in synchron. Uh, and then down here, of course, this, this starts with on something. That's actually a C++ signal uh, calling a callback, which happens to be this piece of, of JavaScript. Um, I have a bigger example if you want to dive further into this. This is uh, a C++ meetup, but it's sort of tied to Qt. Do you give me five minutes? I see nodding heads. <laughs> so then I'm going to figure out how to change project in here without breaking anything. Um, and I'm going to see if I actually reset the code. Yes, I did. So I have commented out parts. So let's have a look at this. Um, this is a really boring application. It uses the plain non-platform specific controls. Uh, I have two panels here. They animate. I don't write any code to do the animation. It's part of the widget. I can move this one. This one moves. <laughs> but also the text here on the second one, the 36 or whatever it says, 36, changes. Uh, I can also click randomize, that changes the value. Very little logic. So, so what's happening here? Uh, the QML code itself is an item, uh, which happens to be sort of the, that panel, the, the left panel. Uh, it contains a column that happens to contain a row that happens to contain a button and a slider. So that's the top part. I could actually, that's these two. Um, and then under those, I have a progress bar. That's the other one that sort of followed the slider. Uh, and then I have some commented out th things that shows the benefits. Uh, you have some IDs for the various layouts. And then if we look at the... Uh, the progress bar, the one that follows it. I say that the value is bound to the random value. So as soon as the random value value changes, it's re-evaluated. So I don't have to sort of catch a change event and do something in imperative code. I just say that this is the relationship. Um, I also do the same thing with a slider. So, so when the, the value of random value changes, it updates the value. That's how the randomize button actually works. But if the value of the slider happens to change, I imperatively set the value of the random value. So I sort of have a full feedback loop there, but I have to do one half imperatively to, to make sure that it goes through. Uh, and when you click the button, I basically call the randomize function of the random value object. So, so what is then the random value object? And that, that's the nice thing of this. Uh, there should be a header file. So it's a queue object. That's completely custom. It inherits the, the very base class of everything, the, the queue object. Uh, then I do some things that I didn't talk about. I, I say that there is a property which happens to be an integer with a name value. If you want to read this, call the function call value. This is where we go from introspection to C++, what, what to actually do. If you want to write it, you call set value. And then I guarantee that every time it changes, I will emit the signal value changed. So I sort of give the behavior of this property. So to QML and Python and, and sort of all these dynamically bound languages, this is what they see in value. Uh, and then this is how it's implemented in C++. And here you have an ordinary value function. And I mean, it's, it's trivial. It returns the value property or, or member version variable. Um, you have a function called randomize, uh, which I simply tag with this macro invocable for the mock to find it and sort of add it into the list of the callable functions. Um, and it's also stupidly trivial. It, it sets the value to random value. Um, and then I have a public slot, so a callback, which, I mean, it's, some, it's a callback, so it's just another function that's called setValue. Uh, 
And this is a very important piece of code. Since you can do circular connections, you need to change, did the value actually change? Otherwise, this will hang. If it did not change, let's not continue and change it. Uh, otherwise, update the value and emit the signal. Um, and all of this is a standard C++, and we didn't have to do anything more th than this to sort of get it to bind and work in the, in the whole QML space, the, the dynamic scriptable part. The, the only thing that we do to, to actually expose it is, this is the boilerplate application that you get when you click next, next, next. Uh, so it creates an application object, it creates an engine for this QML language, and then we say for this engine in the root context, so global variables, yada yada, don't go there. Uh, I actually want to add a property to the global namespace, and it's called random value, and it happens to be an instance of the C++ class. So that, I don't let QML instantiate the object, I just say that here's a pointer, use it, and it's a Q object, so you can introspect it. And then I tell it to use main QML. So it's very easy to cross the boundary. But the things that are sort of interesting is that in here, we did not end up with something that looks... I mean, th this is an extremely trivial dialog box, but you get this. Create all the objects, say how they connect together, and then do the connections. In instead, we sort of create the objects by just calling their names, and you make... It's much more compact, so it's much more expressive in, in what you want to do. So it's the same thing, but, but more compact, and it maps onto the queue objects. But does it scale? So if you use that for a really large application, is it still readable? And I would say so. I, I have some colleagues who've written a, a really large applications. Do you yes, agree? <coughs> you have to consider the structure of the software, and if you do that, it's, uh, it's okay. <laughs> I mean, but it's you have to learn how to work with it, but uh, when you do that, it scales very well. So it's, well, one of the things that I like is that, I mean, no, we don't have an example of that, but slider here. I mean, every word that starts with a, with a capital letter could actually be another QML file. So if I want a custom slider, I just create a file called customslider.qml with a capital C, and then I can instantiate it by just typing it. So you can sort of at least break down your applications. But in, yeah? Uh, I'm thinking about these like, parent-child relationships. So when, yep. you, when you add stuff inside of one other thing, is it just automatically added to the parents list, or do yes. you have to write any code for it? No, it's, what you do have is that the, all of these inherit the item class, uh, because they're visible items or sort of tangible items, uh, and they have a default property called children. So every time you add something into it, like these things that I just instantiate without any left side to the binding, that gets added to the default property. Uh, so that's how it actually works. So this just triggers it to be sort of added to that list, which then has a C++ API because it is uh, a cute list. Uh, but I mean, the, the nice thing, I mean, now we're sort of in, in widget space. It doesn't look like any platform because it's, oh shit, that's really pale. Um, but let's see how these then play out. Uh, the, the nice thing is that you can uh, I just wanted to uh, show here that I could have a, a big red, rec red rectangle that changes along with the progress bar and I mean that, that's not very fun but what you could add is you could actually add the timeline to it and of course you can do that in C++ as well. You need to create a, an animation timeline and sort of make sure to trigger it and so on. But here I can say that the behavior of the width property is that every time you do an animation it's supposed to take this long and it's supposed to do this easing, this curve entering and exiting. So by just adding that behavior line it bounces forth and back. So you sort of, it's very easy to do these things that are complex to set up in C++. It generates a lot of sort of code in your constructor to just set up that relationship. Um, and then since this happens to map to, to OpenGL, um, you can also say here in the, in the sort of top level item, uh, you enable a layer 
which means that you don't render to the screen. You render to a frame buffer object, I think. I might be wrong about the actual term. I'm not an OpenGL expert. And before that reaches the screen, we want to pass it through another QML element, which happens to be a shader. Uh, so now, fingers crossed, let's hope. The blurriness is slightly different depending on, on where the slider is as well. So you sort of can express these things in a very simple way. That would have been pages and pages and pages of C++, but it all ties back into this Q object class that's very easy to work with, very easy to extend, very easy to sort of create new, new business logic elements in. So, I mean, what you generally end up with is, is something like this. You, you have... QML or C++ on the top, depending on if you want to do widgets natively through QML or if you want to carry the QML engine, which actually does add some space. Yep. It's easy to debug. QML. Yeah, yeah that's the soft spot. <laughs> <laughs> so you have a lot of bindings, yes. but the language doesn't really guarantee in which order the bindings are re-evaluated. And then you can add JavaScript to the right side of a binding. And then you have a failure in your JavaScript, and you don't know which of the other bindings were executed before your JavaScript failed. So that's the soft point, yes. Uh, I mean, that's why I have this big blob here saying C++. Yes, you can do little JavaScript things. You, you can set the color to blue, or you can call a function in QML. But if, if you start sorting a list or making sort of more advanced things, you are most likely doing it wrong the business logic should sit in the C++ side. Uh, and then it's actually kind of nice because you... It's very easy to sort of fall into what I call the Visual Basic trap, uh, especially if you use the visual tools so that you double-click the, the push button in your UI and you implement what's supposed to happen at that push button. And then you want to do the same thing with another button. So you double-click that one and you copy-paste code. Here you actually separate the presentation through using a different language from the logic. So you sort of have to define a very, you define a model and then you actually have the presentation on top of it. Uh, so it adds discipline in, in, in my view. You, you cannot cheat anymore. Uh, but at the same time, you have an overhead by carrying OpenGL uh, and, and QML and all of those dependencies. So if you don't use it, if you just want the desktop applications, I would personally still go for the, the good old C++ widgets, just to, to save space and footprint and sort of, if you don't want the timing and the shaders and, and the fancy graphics, you don't need that. But, yeah, if, if you do the, the model presentation separation, you, you can sort of share this code base and do this for devices and this for your management application, for instance. And then in the back end, you, you basically have Qt as a platform abstraction. Uh, it's not only the top half. You, you have the Q network class, you have the Q SQL classes and so on, so you can sort of do your backend integration as well using Qt and then get that cross-platform. Uh, so a good example, if you use SQLite, you can sort of get that through Qt uh, across all your platforms. You don't have to care about building and deploying SQLite for Windows, Mac OS and, and Linux and so on. Um, and you, you have actually support for, I mean, one of the biggest competitors towards Qt today is web apps. Uh, a Qt app does not take half a gig. I'm not complaining about Slack or anything, but it doesn't. <laughs> uh, but you have support for actually talking to web sockets and making HTTP requests. There, there is even a, an official add-on library from the Qt company doing OAuth authentication. So, so even if you have sort of a web app backend and you want it to be accessible through web, you can build a custom application or sort of a native application on top of that REST API or whatever you use in the back end and, and sort of get native performance on the top using C++ and Qt. So it's sort of moving along with time, even though it's based on something from 95. Um, so just to summarize, I mean, I've, I've cherry-picked some of my favorite benefits uh, and I can keep on going. But it's, it's an event-driven C++ <coughs> framework that, in my opinion, is very rich. You, you have most of the widgets to create any applications that you would like. It's fairly easy to extend and so on. 
Uh, the root and what it's actually good at is this, the cross-platform thing. You, you can deploy across all three major desktops. You can deploy across iOS and, and Android. And you can even deploy to, to sort of devices that does not have their own look and feel based on the same C++ code base. Uh, and it's, it's really not only for GUI. It takes away a lot of the pain when it comes to integrating to various things. Do you have pthreads or do you use Windows? Use the qthread class. Um, yeah, but it, it's also interesting when it comes to Qt6 and C++11 and the, the growing overlap. Um, <coughs> Questions? That was someone turning on the video camera, not <laughs> asking a question. Ah. Have you tried with a cross-platform uh, computing for Android, iOS, or Windows? I have not personally used iOS, but I've, I've tried the rest, so to speak. Uh, there are subtle def differences. For instance, the way that, I, uh, that OS X uh, find shared object files means that you you need to know how that works in, in iOS to sort of debug some of the issues that you might bump into. But the, the out-of-box experience is that the basic use cases work. Uh, and then, I mean, if you look at the... I had a modules list somewhere at the start. Um, so all of these things are available for all platforms. Uh, but then you have these, for instance, Android extras which gives you access to Android-specific functions. Uh, and you should have more of those like uh, X11 extras, Windows extras, and so on. So, so you can, of course, do adaptations. But the, the core thing is that you don't have to do that until you find an edge case. And it's, you shouldn't do that <laughs> until you're really trying to integrate with the platform rather than your application. So, so, I mean, if you write an ordinary desktop application that speaks to a web server, for instance, you shouldn't run into Android problems. It's more than you want to access the specific sensor of your phone that you might bump into Android problems, because that's something where you need to be aware of how Android does it. So basically it has all add-on frameworks to generate the native components for different platforms, right? Yeah, so when it comes to, to graphical look and feel, that you actually get through this uh, GUI and, and uh, Qt Quick Controls elements. So, so that you get. It, it looks correct. It's more when it comes to, to actually accessing the platform itself. Uh, I mean, there, there are other things like serial ports have different names between Linux and Unix systems and Windows systems. So even if you have a single C++ class for handling serial ports, the way that you find your serial port is sort of enumerate them to the users different slightly. Uh, so you still need to test across the platform, but uh, the code base are, are very sort of identical. Yeah, uh, sorry, another small question. Yeah, please. Yeah. Have you tried the, have you heard about the uh, React Native? This, this <coughs> part can try to yes. Code once and run everywhere. Yeah, but it's, I mean, the, the benefit to me with web is deployment, yeah. because you have the web browser. But the drawback is just the huge overhead of, I mean, you're using something used to do page layout with hypertext to drive an application. So it's, it's you, the, the whole backwards compatibility with the web from the 90s means that you have huge run times. And, and when someone says web app, I usually say which framework. <laughs> uh, when someone says a specific framework, I'm, I'm not into the details. But I would say that just the size of the binary and the memory requirements would be my personal experience of, of sort of the drawback of a web app. Um, and this way, using the, the newer Qt modules for interacting with web services, uh, you can sort of still use the same client service uh, architecture and, and the same IPCs that you would use to your web app, but you would gain performance benefits from it. But of course, at the cost of implementing it in Qt QML. Again. Oh, <laughs>